part six. <clears throat> that break wasn't for me, it was for you. <laughs> John 17. After these words, Yeshua looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, so that the Son may glorify thee. For thou hast made him sovereign over all mankind, to give eternal life to all whom thou hast given him. This is eternal life, to know thee, who alone art truly God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. For thou hast made him sovereign over all mankind, to give eternal life to all whom thou hast given him. This is eternal life, colon to know thee who alone art truly God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is only the second time that Jesus Christ appears in the Bible. Okay, I'm not going to complain about the name at the moment. Let's make the point. This is eternal life, colon, to know thee who art, to know thee who alone art truly God. That's eternal life. You know God, you have eternal life. I have. I know. I have glorified thee on earth by completing the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in thy own, thy own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world began. Interesting. Again, to me, how can he not be channeling if this translation is correct? I have made thy name known to the men whom thou didst give me out of the world. Ah, I never knew that bit before. John seventeen six, I have made thy name known to the men whom thou didst give me out of the world. Thy name, Jesus. They were thine, thou gavest them to me, and they have obeyed thy command, and now they know that all thy gifts have come to me from thee. For I have taught them all that I learned from thee, and they have received it. They know with certainty that I came from thee. They have had faith to believe that thou didst sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, because they belong to thee. All that is mine is thine, and what is thine is mine, and through them has my glory shone. I am to stay no longer in the world, but they are still in the world, and I am on my way to thee. Holy Father, protect by the power of thy name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. When I was with them I protected when I was with them I protected by the power of thy name those whom thou hast given me, and kept kept them safe. Not one of them is lost except the man who must be lost, for scripture has to be fulfilled. And now I am coming to thee, but while I am still in the world I speak these words, so that they may have my joy within them in full measure. I have de delivered thy word to them, and the world hates them because they are strangers in the world, as I am. I pray thee not to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are strangers in the world, as am I. Consecrate them by the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I now consecrate myself, that they too may be consecrated by the truth. So consecrate means to make sacred. But it is not for those these alone that I pray, but for those also who through their words put their faith in me. May they all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. So also may they be in us, 
that the world may believe that thou didst sent me. The glory which thou gavest me I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and thou in me. May they be perfectly one. Then the world will learn that thou didst sent me, and that thou didst love them as thou didst me. Father, I desire that these men who are thy gift to me may be with me where I am, so that they may look upon my glory, which thou hast given me, because thou didst love me before the world began. O righteous Father, although the world does not know thee, I know thee, and these men know that thou didst sent me. I made thy name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love thou hast for me may be in them, and I may be in them. After these words, Yeshua went out with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Ravine. There was a garden there, and he and his disciples went into it. The place was known to Judas, the, his betrayer, because Yeshua had often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a detachment of soldiers and police provided by the chief priests and the Pharisees equipped with lanterns, torches and weapons, and made his way to the garden. I think it's Gethsemane, I think. Yeshua, knowing all that was coming upon him, went out to them and asked, Who is it that you want? Yeshua of Nazareth, they answered. Yeshua said, I am he. And there stood Judas the traitor with them. And he said, I am he. And they drew back and fell on the ground. Again Yeshua asked, Who is it you want? Yeshua of Nazareth, they answered. Then Yeshua said, I have told you that I am he. If I am the man you want, let these others go. This was to make good his words. I have not lost one of those whom thou gavest me. Thereupon Simon Peter drew the sword he was wearing and struck at the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Yeshua said to Peter, Sheathe your sword. This is the cup the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? The troops with their commander and the Jewish police now arrested Yeshua and secured him. They took him first to Annas. Annas was father-in-law of Cephas, the high priest for that year, the same Cephas who had advised the Jews that it would be to their interest if one man died for the whole people. Yeshua was followed by Simon Peter and another disciple. This disciple, who was acquainted with the high priest, went with Yeshua into the high priest's courtyard but Peter halted at the door outside. So the other disciple, the high priest's acquaintance, went out again and spoke to the woman at the door and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Are you another of this man's disciples? I am not, he said. The servants and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing round it warming themselves and Peter too was standing with them sharing the warmth. The high priest questioned Yeshua about his disciples and about what he taught. Yeshua replied, I have spoken openly to all the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all Jews congregate. I have said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask my hearers what I told them. They know what I said. When he said this, one of the police who was standing next to him struck him on the face, exclaiming, is that the way to answer the high priest? Yeshua replied, If I spoke amiss, state it in evidence. If I spake, spoke well, why strike me? So Anas sent him to bound to Cephas in the high priest. So Anas sent him bound to Cephas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter stood warming himself. The others asked, Are you another of his disciples? But he denied it. I am not, he said. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, insisted, Did I not see you with him in the garden? Peter denied again, and just then a cock crew. From Cephas, Yeshua was led into the governor's headquarters. It was now early morning and the Jews themselves stayed outside the headquarters to avoid defilement so that they could eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and asked, what charge do you bring against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we should not have brought him before you. Pilate said, take him away and try him in your own law. The Jews answered, 
We are not allowed to put any man to death. Thus they ensured the fulfilment of the words by which Yeshua had indicated the manner of his death. Pilate then went back into his headquarters and summoned Je uh, Yeshua. Are you the king of the Jews? he asked. Yeshua said, Is that your own idea or have others suggested it to you? What am I a Jew? said Pilate. Your own nation and their chief priests have brought you before me. What have you done? Yeshua replied, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If it did, my followers would be fighting to save me from arrest by the Jews. My kingly authority comes from elsewhere. You are a king then, said Pilate. Yeshua answered, King is your word. My task is to bear witness to the truth. For this I was born, for this I came into the world. And all who are not deaf to truth listen to my voice. Pilate said, What is truth? And with those words went out again to the Jews. For my part, he said, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner for you at Passover. Would you like me to release the king of the Jews? Again the clamour rose. Not him, we want Barabbas. Barabbas was a bandit. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, just that last sentence there, that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of dispute about that. First, apparently there would be no custom for them to release someone at Passover. In fact, it would be more likely that they would just crucify more people. And the second thing is that a lot of people think that Yeshua's had a nickname. And his nickname would have been Barabbas. There we go. Pilate now took Yeshua and had him flogged, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and placed it on his head, and robed him in a purple cloak, and then time after time they came up to him crying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him in the face. One more Pilate, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Here he is, I am bringing him out to let you know that I find no case against him, and Yeshua came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. Behold the man, said Pilate. The chief priests and their henchmen saw him and shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Take him and crucify him yourself, said Pilate. For my part I find no case against him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard that, he was more afraid than ever, and going back to his headquarters, he asked Yeshua, Where have you come from? But Yeshua gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? said Pilate. Surely you know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you. You would have no authority at all over me, Yeshua replied, if it had not been granted to you from above, and therefore the deeper guilt lies with the one what lies with the man who handed me over to you. From that moment, Pilate tried hard to release him, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Any man who claims to be a king is divine Caesar. When Pilate heard what they were saying, he brought Yeshua out and took his seat on the tribunal at the place known as the pavement, Gabbatha in the language of the Jews. It was on the eve of Passover about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify your king, said Pilate. We have no king but Caesar, the Jews replied. Then at last, to satisfy them, he handed Yeshua over to be crucified. Yeshua was now taken in charge, and carrying his own cross, went out to the place of the skull, as it is called, or in the Jews' language, Golgotha where they crucified him, and him, and with him two others, one on the right and one on the left, and Yeshua in between them. And Pilate wrote an inscription to be fastened to the cross. It read, Yeshua of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This inscription was read by many Jews, because the place where Yeshua was crucified was not far from the city, and the inscription was in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. Then the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of Jews, write 
He claimed to be the king of Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. The soldiers, having crucified Yeshua, took possession of his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. Leaving out the tunic, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece throughout. So they said to one another, We must not tear this, let us toss for it. And thus the text of the scripture came true. They shared my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. That is what the soldiers did. But meanwhile near the cross where Yeshua hung stood his mother with her sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Yeshua saw his mother with the disciple whom he loved standing beside her. He said to her, Mother, there is your son, and to the disciple, there is your mother. And from that moment the disciple took her into his home. By the way, we all know, don't we, that Mary Magdala was his soulmate, his, his lover. And, you know, so they put, they called the disciple he loved him and they've just referred to her as son but that's because the people translating this bible just couldn't handle you know him having a girlfriend but we all know that and from that moment the disciple took her into his home okay after that yeshua aware that all had now come to its appointed end said in fulfillment of scripture I thirst. A jar stood there full of sour wine, so they soaked a sponge with the wine, fixed it on a javelin, and held it up to his lips. Having received the wine, he said, It is accomplished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Because it was the eve of Passover, the Jews were anxious that the body should not remain on the cross for the coming Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they requested Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers accordingly came to the first of his fellow victims and to the second and broke their legs. But when they came to Yeshua they found that he was already dead, so they did not break his le legs. But one of the soldiers stabbed his side with a lance and at once there was a flow of blood and water. This vouched for by an eyewitness whose evidence is to be trusted. He knows that he speaks the truth, so that you too may believe. For this happened in fulfilment of the text of scripture. No bone of his body shall be broken. And another text says, They shall look on him whom they pierce. After that, Pilate was approached by Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Yeshua, but a secret disciple for fear of the Jews, who asked to be allowed to remove the body of Yeshua. Pilate gave the permission, so Joseph came and took the body away. He was joined by Nicodemus, the man who had first visited Jesus by night, who brought him in a mixture of myrrh and aloes, more than half a hundredweight, and they took the body of Yeshua and wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen cloth according to Jewish burial customs. Now at the place where he had been crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, not yet used for burial. There, because the tomb was near at hand, and because it was the eve of the Jewish Sabbath, they laid Je Yeshua. Early on the Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance, and ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. well, you know. Why, why separate and say the one that Jesus loved when, do you know what I mean, and he loved them all? Uh, they'd, they'd rather he'd be gay than, uh, you know, normal. It's Mary Magdala. They have taken the Lord out of his tomb, she cried, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other set out, you know, and they never name him. I know a lot of people say it's John, but... And if this is John writing, why don't you say me? So Peter and the others set out and made their way to the tomb. They were running side by side, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He peered in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but did not enter. 
Then Simon Peter came up following him, and he went to the, into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying and the napkin which had been laid over his head, not lying with the wrappings, but rolled together in a place by itself. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first went in too, and he saw and believed. Until then they had not understood the scriptures which showed that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went home again, but Mary stood at the tomb outside weeping. So she, you know, she's the one who's most affected, it seems. As she wept, she peered into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Yeshua had lain. They said to her, Why are you weeping? She answered, They have taken the Lord away, and I do not know where they have laid him. With these words she turned round and saw Yeshua standing there, but did not recognise him. Yeshua said to her, Why are you weeping? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking it was a gardener. She said, If it is you, sir, who removed him, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Yeshua said, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for my master. Yeshua said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I now ascend, I am now ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Yeah. Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with her news. I have seen the Lord, she said, and gave them his message. Late that Sunday evening, when the disciples were together behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, Yeshua came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said, and then showed him his hands and his side. So when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Yeshua repeated, Peace be with you, and said, As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any man's sins, they stand, un they stand forgiven. If you pronounce them unforgiven, unforgiven they remain. One of the twelve, Thomas, that is the twin, was not with the rest when Je Yeshua came. So the disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, he said, unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands, unless I put my finger into the place where his nails were, and my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were again in the room, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Yeshua came and stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, see my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Be unbelieving no longer, but believe. Thomas said, My Lord and my God, Yeshua said, because you have seen me, you have found faith. Happy are they who never saw me, and yet have found faith. There were indeed many other signs that Yeshua performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Those here written have been recorded in order that you may hold the faith that Yeshua is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this faith you may possess life by his name. Some time later, Yeshua showed himself to the disciples once again by the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way Simon Peter and Thomas, the twin, were together with Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples who were also there. Simon Peter said, I am going out fishing. We will go with you, said the others. So they started and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Morning came and there stood Yeshua on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Yeshua. He called out to them, Friends, have you caught anything? They answered, No. He said, Shoot the net to the starboard and you will make a catch. They did so and found they could not haul the net aboard. There were so many fish in it. Then the disciple whom Yeshua loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, he wrapped his coat about him, for he had stripped, and plunged into the sea. The rest of them came on in the boat, towing the full net of fish, 
for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards. When they came ashore they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish laid on it and some bread. Yeshua said, Bring some of your catch. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to land, full of big fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them, and yet many as they were, the net was not torn. Yeshua said, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Yeshua now came up, took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish in the same way. This makes the third time that Yeshua appeared to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. I just think it's interesting that many times they didn't recognise him. I guess partly is you think someone's died, you're not expecting to see them. And maybe as they wanted to see him so much they were sort of reluctant to believe it was him before they were sure but you know why was there something that he wasn't completely fully manifested in some way was he difficult to see or something it's interesting after breakfast Yeshua said to Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than all else yes Lord he answered you know that I love you then feed my lambs he said a second time he asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then tend my sheep. A third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that he asked him a third time. Do you love me? Lord, he said, you know everything. You know I love you. Yeshua said, feed my sheep. <clears throat> so that sounds like the, um, you know, Basically, is handing it to Peter. Sounds like it to me. And further, I tell you this in very truth. When you were young, you fastened your belt about you and walked where you chose. But when you are old, you will stretch out your arms and a stranger will bind you fast and carry you where you have no wish to go. He said this to indicate the manner of death by which Peter was to glorify God. Then he added, follow me. Oh, so the glorifying bit then, the, to glo you know, to, to glorify God, you know, to have that faith to the point where you're prepared to just lose your life, is glorifying God. Peter looked round and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, the one who at supper had leaned back close to him and asked the question, Lord, who is it that will betray you? When he caught sight of him, Peter asked, Lord, what will happen to him? Yeshua said, If it should be my will that he wait until I come, what is it to you? Follow me. I'll just read that again. If it should be my will that he wait until I come, what is it to you? Follow me. That saying of Jesus, Yeshua became current in the brotherhood and was taken to mean that the dis that that disciple would not die. But in fact, Yeshua did not say that he would not die. He only said, if it should be my will that he wait until I come, what is it to you? Nobody knows that. It is this same disciple who attests what has here been written. It is in fact he who wrote it, and we know that his testimony is true. Um, interesting. There's always a bit of a puzzle. Who's John? Because it's not John the Baptist, right? So it's John the Apostle. But we don't really know who it is. So maybe, this is a maybe, right, definitely Yeshua, you know, him just loving one disciple, you know, he just put Peter out from the rest, you know, he wants Peter to take over. So, unless they're saying that Yeshua was gay for him, why would they make that distinction, the one whom he loved? Because it was a girl. But they can't admit this in the Bible, because the Bible, the world was so patriarchal, they wouldn't accept that. 
Ha! I've always loved the book of John in a way because it's different from the others. Ha! So maybe written by a woman. And so maybe Mary wrote Revelations as well. Interesting. There is much else that Yeshua did, if it were all to be recorded in detail, I suppose the whole world could not hold the books that would be written. I mean, there is a Mary Magdalene Gnostic text that wasn't included, and it's got some interesting bits, but it's very short, so maybe she did a lot more. And they went, in, and they went each into his home, and Yeshua to the Mount of Olives. At daybreak he appeared again in the temple, and all the people gathered round him. He had taken his seat and was engaged in teaching them, when the doctors of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught committing adultery. Making her stand out in the middle, they said to him, Master, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the law Moses has laid down that such women are to be stoned. What do you say about it? They put the question as a test hoping to frame a charge against him. So I think this is back when he was alive. And so it's just titled... So I think that is the end there. And this is an added bit. And let's just carry on reading it. Because why they, you know, once he's come back to... To, from the dead, they're not trying to test him and stuff. So this this is, must be something added in. Yeshua bent down <clears throat> and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they continued to press their question, he sat up straight and said, That one of you who is faultless shall throw the first stone. Then once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard what he said, one by one they went away, the eldest first. And Yeshua was left alone with the woman still standing there. Yeshua again sat up and said to the woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She answered, No one, sir. Yeshua said, Nor do I condemn you. You may go. Do not sin again. Whew. <laughs> that's, that's John. Okay. Maybe it's been useful. Who knows? Ciao.